Okay, I'm happy to be here at this year's 2021 SAFE Forum, and I'm going to give a talk about building next generation AI chips. And I'm going to share some thoughts about how AI is changing how we build the chips and how some other developments, you know, let us go build this modern silicon. Okay, so our vision is software 2.0, and that means using big data to train networks to do useful things as opposed to writing lots of code to do the programs that we used to build, right? And that's step one. Step two is we're gonna see more and more use of algorithms to train the networks, either it's adversarial, there's all kinds of methods that are gonna come out, and the computers are literally gonna to start to think about the problems they're solving. And we've seen unbelievable results. Autonomous driving is a great example. There used to be a lot of code behind each object detection. Um, it was classic vision code, there was lots of it. And now with big data sets, you can, you can find all the objects, you can find the path, you can even find the intention of the actors in the scene. And that's a big transition. And this is driven by computational intensity. So back in, you know, before 1980s, it was mostly scalar kind of programming. Around 80, we started to see vectors come out. Then we started to see, you know, vector units, multi-core, GPU programming, we could do big matrices. But today, we're building silicon specifically built to do AI computation. And that's driven by density and foundry process and driven by the new AI algorithms. And it's changing how we think. I just want to show this, and I think of this as how we used to build chips in the old days. We would have literally you know, 50, 100 IPs integrated together, a diverse, large number of interfaces. It took a big team to put the whole chip together. Right? That led to large teams, expensive tape outs, multiple passes to get silicon, and it's very irregular and it's very difficult to do. Now, things started to change in the last five to 10 years because of foundry process shuttles, high quality PDKs. And I wanted to call out one example is silicon proven IP really works. And this is so interesting because there's multiple vendors, tier one CAD companies, foundries, startups, some in-house design. And when we build chips today, we always take the physically hardened stuff, put it on test chips, on shuttles, and we integrate it together, we get it. And you think, well, that's good for all the old IPs, but we just spec'd out a new chip in an advanced technology node, and we have multiple sources for PCI Express Gen 5, uh, DDR5, 400 gigabit ethernet, and I was joking with somebody, it's getting to the point where you think, maybe I can go to Home Depot and get all the IP I need off the shelf, which really changes how we build chips. And it changes our ability to hit that first pass. Along with that approach of proven IP, we really think about modular design, right? Everything we build from top down. Um, in TensorFlow, we think about on the hardware side, you know, we start with foundry technology, libraries, CAD tools, and methodology, and we put that together, and we spend a lot of time determining how we're gonna build a chip. And then we have proven IP, and then our own IP, we put that together in an SOC. It's a very clean process, and I'll show you an example of one of our chips. On the software side from the top, PyTorch programs run through our graph compiler, and then we literally place them out that on our chip, that's coordinated by our AI operating system, which then calls kernels and the data flow to manage the, sync, the, the, the computation. Each layer of that is very carefully thought out and very clean between them. And that lets us get to one pass silicon. It gets a smaller team, still an expensive tape out, um, but it's really changed the nature of the chips we can build. Unlike recent generations of client chips, mobile chips, AI computation is very regular, right? That means a large array of AI processors working together to run a very large program programmed by data, right? Our recent chip, our second generation chip we call Wormhole, it's literally six partitions, right? The AI processor, memory, ethernet, PCI Express, we have a control processor on the die, and then we have a small system management unit. And the way we thought about building this is, for like the memory controller, we have a GDR6 Phi, GDR6 memory controller, and a knock interface. We made that one physical partition. We built that very carefully, 
And then we did the same thing with PCI Express, Ethernet, and then even our AI processor. We have a big AI processor, a knock interface, and our top level chip is literally knock, clock, and scan. Puts the whole thing together. That makes the design very manageable, very clean to put together, so we can move to the next process node very quickly when we need to. We can also, in each of those boxes, it's a standalone unit, we can test it very, very thoroughly. All right, this is a really cool way to build silicon. Our approach at the system level is similar. We think of this as very modular. We have an AI processor, which has a math unit, a local memory. It has packet processors, not control. And we do a lot of processing right there. That's a very testable, clean unit. We put an array of those together to make a very large AI processing array. Then we build a, a rack unit where we can build from 8 to 32 chips in a single 4U shelf. And then, of course, we stack those in a rack, and then we put a bunch of racks together to make a big AI computer. Right. Each component is tested, you know, it's very clean to put together, and it's very different from a very heterogeneous computer. Our computers include AI processing, memory controllers, PCI Express, and Ethernet, all integrated in the same guy, and we use that both at, the, you know, the single chip level, the module level, and across the whole system. One thing I've been thinking about recently is not only is, like, foundry silicon, clean libraries, and CAD tools important, it's interesting how important open software has been to AI processing, right? The models are, it's so interesting how many different people are collaborating on building new models, university professors, researchers, people inside companies. When the new models work better, they're published. People go take those models, experiment on them, iterate on them, fine tune them. And there's literally places you can get libraries of models, pre-trained models. You can do your own fine tuning. And this is a very open environment. Same thing happened on uh, the frameworks, PyTorch, TensorFlow, CAFE. There's new uh, frameworks in development. Those are very easy to use. They're very open. Uh, Linux has been there forever. Same with networking, storage, uh, cloud computing coordination. And one thing that we're going to see more and more of is RISC-V processors. So our chips, we use five small RISC-V processors in our AI processor, and they do some of the computational work and some of the coordination work, right? And we are gonna really support open source, right? So we support one of the open source RISC-V models, or reference models today. We're gonna open source our small RISC-V core. We're also looking at open sourcing a vector unit and maybe a couple of steps beyond that. We think RISC-V is really cool because, you know, we can do experiments with it really fast we think the combination of AI processing with a small amount of general computing tightly coupled together is important. And RISC-V gives us the opportunity to put those things together and do experiments. And with that, I'd like to introduce, we're building our own high-performance RISC-V processor we call Escalon. It's 64 bits. It's very fully featured. Floating point, vector unit, atomics. Um, we're going to build this as a very large, high-performance processor. 8-fetch, 6-issue, very modern branch unit, um, four energy units, two vector units, two floating point units, two load store units. Um, so this is going to be a very high performance risk 5 core. Now, to build a modern processor, it's complicated, and we're, we're taking the same modular approach, right? So our performance model, our reference model, our architecture and our RTL model are all partitioned at a module boundary that are very cleanly defined interfaces and we can take code from one level to the other and run them between those pieces. So it's a very interesting way to build a processor. We have that opportunity to do it because of Tensor, this is a clean slate design and also the RISC-V architecture gives us the tools to go do those things. At the chip level, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how do we want to build this and integrate this together. We think the vision of 2.0 is a lot of AI programs trained from data on models. But there's other things that the system has to do. There's networking, there's storage, there's data preparation, there's statistics, there's some coordination. And we also find sometimes in models that there's an AI computation that wants to communicate directly with a uh, general purpose program. Right? So we're going to build a cluster of these processors together. Our first design is eight CPUs, eight megabyte cache, 
it's actually built on the same knock that the AI processors use. And there's two ways this works. One is the AI processor can send data directly to this processor's cache. It can do processing and send it right back as part of the graph. We can also build these processors a co coherent array, but we're not changing the knock to have a cache coherence protocol. We're going to transport our cache coherent protocol all over the same knock. Right, so we can build an array of AI processors, an array of CPUs. They communicate over the same knock. And then at the memory controller, we'll build in front of that both a memory cache and a directory. So if we want to do cache, uh, cache coherency across multiple clusters of processors, we can do that as well. We think this gives us a really nice integration. So our belief for AI is its combination of AI performance, network performance, memory performance, CPU performance, all integrated tightly together. Building for the future is really about modular, provable design. Right? To build, the way to build high-performance chips is you have to get the details right, but then the pieces really have to go together. And the result of that is a great system. It's easy to build. And you can do it with a smaller team and make progress. We think the next five years of AI is going to be a massive amount of innovation, both around the processors, the algorithms, and how the chips work together. And I just wanted to say one more thing, and I hope people have seen this talk. I really liked it. And there's been a bunch of really good talks about AI you know, out on the internet, but I watched this recently, our friends at OpenAI. They did a demo of using a version of GPT-3, I think, to write code that created, in real time, a computer game. And at the end of the talk, they said something that was really cool. The AI was trained to talk to APIs, right? And we think we are approaching all our design to have really clean definitions at the boundaries, which at some level are like APIs. And we think we're going to use AI to build test benches, to test our code, to verify blocks. We think we're going to get to the point where we're going to have AI design some of the code. And I think we're going to get ready for like an AI-driven generation. We've already seen AI used for placement routing CAD tools for a number of other things. I think it's going to be in formal verification and test benches. And we're going to use it to literally do our design. So look for the open AI talk on Codex. It's really fun. And there's some other people doing some really cool work here. And that's going to impact how we build the chips. It's really interesting how the combination of AI algorithms and, and foundry technology density has enabled a whole new generation of computing. If people don't realize, that at some level, could we run these AI programs we have today on computers from 20 years ago? Yeah, maybe, but they would take forever. Today, training is you know, anywhere from minutes to weeks to months. Inference can be very fast. The computational intensity behind that is just incredible. So the technology, the algorithms working together, enables AI computing. To build complicated chips, you really need modular design. You really need to think out every single boundary. And we're going to get to the point where every boundary has to be really provable. If you put 10 complicated things together, you can't prove anything about how they work. So we're going to have to have really clean boundaries and do that. And every IP, and I think everybody building IP needs to be thinking, how do I make sure this is super provable against a really clean interface? We're going to use AI and intelligence in everything we do. We see it in place around tools. We're going to see it in verification. We're going to see it in test generation. We're going to see it in, in um, how we build the chips. And I think we're getting ready for uh, AI as part of how we do all our silicon. So thank you very much. It was great talking today. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>